students, partners, administrators, thank you so much for being here today. You guys, give yourself a round of applause for making it out. My name is Jana Babatunde Bay. I am the president of the Will and Jada Smith Family Foundation. Uh, obviously, this is the Careers and Entertainment Tour. This is our first launch city for a nationwide tour of panels and exhibits introducing young people like yourselves to the multitude of careers available in the entertainment business. So I hope today you've come to learn. Most importantly, I hope that you've come today to have a good time. We have some fantastic exhibits, folks that have a lot of information and a true desire and open heart to share it with you, ask questions, get involved, have a good time with it, and please make the connection with all of the folks that we have here today. There's somebody that wants to work with you, somebody that is inspired by your genius, and a ton of us that are here really just with a, a true heart to make sure that we give our best to you, and I hope that you too will give it right back. I want you to know I'm really proud of each and every one of you taking the initiative to invest in yourselves. One of the reasons why Will and I wanted to put together careers and entertainment tour is because you guys are the future. It's you. We need your vision to shape how you see your world. So what we want to do is give you access, be a liaison to this profession, our industry, the entertainment industry that is seemingly exclusive, but it's not. And we want to help create paths for you, for any interest that you might have. You'll be really surprised to know that any interest that you might have is applicable to the entertainment industry. It's just helping you understand how getting you the education of how to open those doors for yourself and helping you to professionally develop. So what we want to do with careers in entertainment is give you access to professionals from all parts of our profession. And today, you're also going to have some interactive experience. But I just want to say thank you for being here. I want to say thank you for taking the initiative once again to take control of your future. And I am really happy to see you here. So thank you. I'm going to pass it back to Jana. <laughs> so we can get started. Thank you. Thank you, Jada. Uh, you know, great things happen when people come together to make them happen. We have some tremendous partners. We have been really blessed and honored to work with some really fantastic folks that have made today possible. I want to bring them up and have them speak to you for just a moment and let you know a little bit about why they're here and, what, and how this all came together. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce our group. Uh, I really can't say enough about how important it is, the work that we've done in collaboration today. But Julie Menon, if you would please come up. The film commissioner at the New York City Mayor's Office. Plus her foot. <laughs> Dr. Judy Rowan, Roden, I'm so sorry, from the Rockefeller Foundation. Chris Upperman from the Small Business Administration. and Mr. Michael Smith, who's a special assistant to President Obama and my brother's keeper. I'm actually ask you to speak first. Well, thank you so much, Jana. I'm Julie Menon, Commissioner of Media and Entertainment for New York City, and I am so thrilled to be here. I guess literally they don't have to tell me to break a leg, since that is what I've already done. Uh, but I'm delighted to be here. And I really want to thank Will and Jada Smith, because um, as you may know, there are many cities across the United States they could have picked to start this tour, but they picked our great city. And so we really want to thank them for investing in New York City. 
And I also want to thank the other partners today, the Rockefeller Foundation, my brother's keeper, our Department of Education, SBA. You're going to hear from all of them today. So all 500 of you in this room have a remarkable opportunity. Some of the biggest names in media and entertainment are going to be right here today speaking to you. And they're going to tell you about what they do and how they got to their position. And most importantly, they're going to be showing you that you can reach those same goals in the careers of media and entertainment. As New Yorkers, you've already checked off an important box. You are here where the action is today. And so that's really the first step to make it happen. There simply is no place like New York in terms of filming and production and the iconic locations and career opportunities we have today. I want to tell you that right now in New York City, we film 52 different TV episodic shows. That's 52. That's more than any other city. We also filmed 336 movies this past year here in New York City. So there really are amazing opportunities in production. You might have seen our logos, our iconic made in New York trucks are all over New York City and they really show what the opportunities are. We have here today a table, our made in New York table. We can talk to you about the career opportunities that are available. Right now there are 130,000 New Yorkers who are employed in film and TV right now in New York City. And some of them are in front of the camera, actors and actresses, but many of them are behind the camera. Um, and there are people who are making TV shows and films possible from production assistants, set designers, designers, agents, cinematographers, and many, many more. So we really hope today that you will make sure to talk to all of the folks in media and entertainment and open up those career opportunities today. So thanks so much for being here, and we really look forward to continuing this dialogue with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Rodin, please come on up. Well, good morning. It's so great to see you all here. How are you feeling? Good, good. That's how you should be feeling. And we're so grateful to Will and Jada Smith, the wonderful foundation work that they've done, and all of our partners who are here on the stage with us. But I'm especially glad, of course, to see all of you, the young people who are going to be the future actors and directors and lighting specialists and script writers. And we are here today to help you get started. You know, last year at the Emmy Awards, Viola Davis took the internet by storm. One short sentence in her historic acceptance speech said it all. She said, you cannot win an Emmy for roles that simply are not there. Many people, Will and Jada included, have identified one of the glaring problems in the entertainment industry, and that is the lack of women and people of color on the screen. But Viola was getting at a deeper truth. It matters who tells our story. And we can't solve the most visible part of the problem without addressing its underlying cause. And that is one reason why this Careers in Entertainment initiative is such a transformative step forward for all of you. It's opening doors to the entertainment industry, not only in front of the camera, but behind it. And in the process, and think of the role that you will play in this, the initiative is not only fostering greater inclusion in the creative process, but in the economic process as well. Every investment in one of you, a promising high school student, is an investment in so many more. Because of course, here's your responsibility. Getting your foot in the door is the first step. And of course, then you have to get a leg in and a hip in and everything else. But importantly, once you are in, you've got to prop that door open for someone else. At the Rockefeller Foundation, <laughs> Rockefeller is so proud to support this work. We've been working tirelessly for many years now in trying to link more young people, both in this country and around the world, to more jobs, to foster greater participation in the labor force, and therefore to build a more inclusive economy. As the White House Council of Economic Advisors has pointed out, when young people, especially young people of color, face barriers to reach their full potential, the human cost is enormous, but so is the cost to the United States economy. 
If working age men of color had the opportunity to participate in the labor force at the same rate as white men of the same age, we would increase the United States global domestic product, product by 2%. That is huge, folks. It is really significant, and you are going to make the difference in how the next generation does it. So to Jada and Will for opening the door for so many others, to all of you who are so invested in building career pipelines for young people of all backgrounds, this is so exciting, and I thank the many industry experts who are willing to open these doors as well. I'll be watching you. I can't wait to see where your careers take you. But I have to say, if you ever decide to pursue your careers in the nonprofit sector, give me a call. Thank you, Dr. Rodin. That was very powerful and insightful. Thank you for your words. I'd also like to introduce you guys to Mr. Chris Upperman from the Small Business Administration. Thank you. So good morning, good morning. Uh, it is just so exciting to be here. I'm very, very pleased. Uh, thank you, Ms. Smith and Mr. Smith, for your leadership uh, for the Careers and Entertainment Tour. We're really appreciative of that. And to all the other partners here. Um, so I'm, I'm Chris Upperman from the Small Business Administration. And as I had a conversation with the Will Smith and Jada uh, Smith Family Foundation, I said that there's a key point to also include here in terms of the self-employment opportunities that exist for you all, for the careers that exist in the uh, film industry. And I just want each of you to think about that. What we want to create are opportunities for each of you to consider starting your own at some point. Many of you are so young right now, and this is just a prime opportunity for you. I'm just really, really excited and, 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 and enthusiastic for the opportunities and the promise of your tomorrow. You're the next generation of leaders, and I want you to really take this opportunity. There are a lot of exhibitors here who have taken time out to be here because they really believe in you and in your future. I'm just gonna keep my uh, comments really, really short, but I do wanna tell you one thing. It's about exposure. What we want to do is for each of you to have the opportunity to see people behind the screen, know of the opportunities and jobs that exist out here and the other opportunities for you to really take hold of those. When I was a freshman in college at Georgia State University, I actually began working on the side with a celebrity chef. Uh, she was a chef to Ludacris, who many of you might know. And I did some side work in craft services and it took me all across America. I actually was able to sit on um, a video set with with Kanye West, with Pharrell, with a number of really big stars. And look at me now today, I work for a president and work in an administration. So it's all about that exposure and you never know where it's gonna take you. So once again, I just wanna thank all the partners. I wanna thank Mr. and Mrs. Smith again uh, for the leadership and you all please enjoy yourself and take advantage of what you have here today. All right, and last but certainly not least, Mr. Michael Smith, Special Assistant to President Obama. Good morning, New York, how you doing? How you doing? It's a beautiful day in New York. This is a beautiful sight. I wish you could see what I am seeing here today. Uh, there are a lot of people in the news that say young people are just interested in playing video games and getting lost on Pokemon Go. Uh, <laughs> are a little apathetic, not so sure about the world, but I see some bright, beautiful faces in here that are smart, that are talented, that are innovative, and are about to change the world. I'm excited for you. So I'm thrilled to be here today on behalf of the president, um, and I just want to share two quick things with you. Um, one, I want to share a life lesson. Some people talk about it, some people are about it. And let me tell you that Jada Smith and Will Smith and the Will and Jada Smith Foundation are about it. It was about a year ago that Broderick Johnson, who chairs the My Brother's Keeper Task Force, and I went and met with Jana and her team uh, at their offices in California. And we were brainstorming all sorts of ideas. And we came up with this idea, how could you take this on the road? And Jana said, I'm going to talk to Jada about that. I think we could do it. And you know, we have a lot of meetings with people who want to just have meetings. They made this happen. They made it bigger. They made it better for you. 
So hang out with people that are about it. And I, I think one of the things that's so important, you know, this isn't just about being around celebrities or being in front of the camera. It's so important that we see Jada on TV. It's so important that we see ourselves. But maybe equally important is that we shape the stories of today and that we shape the stories that are going to define the future. So that's why I'm excited about this conversation today. The second thing that I want to tell you is the president sent me here today to tell you that you matter. You matter to us, you matter to this country. We, we were with the president about uh, a little over a year ago in the Bronx at uh, Lehman College to launch something called the My Brother's Keeper Alliance. And the president was giving his remarks and he went off script. So all the staff, we have his speech there and, he go, and we're going, oh my goodness, what's he doing? And he said, you know, I wanna take a minute and I wanna talk to the young people that are sitting here today. And he said, I want you to know that there's nothing not a single thing that's more important to the future of America than whether or not you and young people like you can achieve your dreams. He didn't say this is a moral obligation. He didn't say it's a nice thing to do. He said there's not a single thing that's more important to the future of America than whether kids like you can achieve your dreams. Why is that? Because we need you. You don't need us. Our economy is dependent on you being the next Will and Jadas. Our economy is dependent on you being the next per iPhone creators, the next engineers, the next scientists, the next producers, the next directors. We need you. So that's why the president wanted me to come and tell you we're excited about uh, what's going to be launched here today. And I just want to close, um, you know, as Chris said, I, you know, about a personal story. I'm from Springfield, Massachusetts, which sounds like an idyllic little town, but it's a tough town. Um, my parents were both 16 years old when I was born. Uh, I was growing up in the 80s during the crack epidemic. I lost my brother uh, to the war in the streets. Um, and so many of my friends didn't make it. And I stand here today representing the President of the United States because people opened doors for me, whether it was at a Boys and Girls Club, Whether it was sitting at a dinner when I was 15 and my congressman said, you know, you could intern on Capitol Hill when you're 16, we can help you find housing. I didn't know I could do that. And it opened doors. And so just get excited about the doors that will be open today for you. And as Judith said, never forget to reach back and open that door because America will only continue to be great when we recognize that our neighbor's kids are our kids too. Thank you, Jada. Thank you, Will. Thank you, partners. God bless you all. I'd like to introduce our moderator, uh, Mr. Hill Harper. Yeah, 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 yeah. Award-winning actor. Award-winning. Best-selling author. Best-selling author. Philanthropist. Philanthropist. And just bad, bad joker. And just an amazing, <laughs> what's up, you guys? Oh. Talk to me, make some noise. Thank you so All much, All right, Hill. check it out. I love you guys, you're incredible. Turn to your neighbor on the right and say, neighbor. You a star. Neighbor, turn back and say, I already knew that. That's right. All you guys are stars. You're superstars. I'm glad you're here. And I got an amazing panel I'm going to bring up for you. I, it is like, this is like superstar times 10. That's why I'm going to introduce them like we're at a game. Who here has ever been to a, 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 a Knicks game? Who's been to a Nets game? Who's been to the... Uh, uh, the New York Liberty game. <laughs> Who's never been to a game? We got tickets for everybody. I'm kidding. There ain't no tickets. Okay. Okay, check it out. I got this panel, this incredible panel. Do come closer. Okay, stop. Stop, stop, stop. George Lucas. The founder, executive creator, producer for Baked, FX, post-production studios. Give it up. I got Kevin Lynn. He is the uh, theater agent for the leading entertainment sports entertainment agency, CAA. Kevin Lynn. Next up is my man, Michael Biederman. Michael Biederman's producer and production manager known for the Adjustment Bureau Spotlight Arbitrage, etc. Now, this brother's a bad brother. Sean Martinborough, he's the creator, 
and, and artists from Marvel and DC Comics drawing Batman, Luke Cage, Black Panther. Oh, my God. So good. I got my man, Caleb Pinkett. Yeah. Caleb Pinkett's producer, After Earth. Annie Claddle Beauty is also an actor. Super talented. Super talented. And then, and then, I got my girl. Hold on. Hold on. How you guys walking in? What's happening? Good? All right. Thanks for coming. Late. I'm glad you're here. Late. But you're right on time because we got superstar actress Regina Hall. When the bow breaks. I mean, she's one of the most talented, beautiful, funny, intelligent women. And then, and then, and then, <laughs> and then we got my buddy, who's not in my notes. He's not on my card. He's my good friend. Gabriel. Gabriel, who was supposed to be in the second panel, but he decided to be in the first panel. So, so check it out. Give it up for a whole panel, you guys. Okay. I'm coming down here with y'all, you know, because we're all in this together. You know, you know, I got a couple questions. I want to throw it out to the panel. You're looking, what you're looking at right here is a whole cross-section of the entertainment industry. You have producers, you have agents, you have artists, actors, you have this whole cross-section. And, and what's amazing is I want to throw out a real general question to the panel first. Um, does everybody have their microphones? Testing, testing. Yep. Regina, you're hello, sitting on your hello, mic. Hello, hello, yep. Okay, you might want to pull that out. That's good, that's good. Thank you. And so, so would you guys just give us a quick overview? What attracted you to just being in the entertainment business at first? What was the first attraction for some of you? Go ahead. Well, I can. I, I guess since I'm an artist, just read, growing up reading comics, growing up reading Marvel and DC Comics just really inspired me to want to draw and create my own characters and my own, my own superheroes. Now, now, somebody who's out there, let's, I want to stick with you, uh, uh, Martin. Somebody who's out here, uh, or Sean, somebody who's out here who wants to... Hey, hey, you guys, welcome. Come on in. What's going on? It's good to see you. So someone who's out here who, who draws or is an artist but, but doesn't necessarily think that they could actually make a living or a career doing it, how should they think about what they do if they're doodling in their notebook and they're like, these are kind of cool characters or something like that? In fact, let me ask, anybody out here is an artist? Do you draw? Do you, do you create? So, so there's a lot of folks out here that actually create and draw. What, how should they be thinking about it? Can they actually have a career doing that? Yeah, actually, this is a really great time to be in comics just because there's so many, everybody is looking for the next graphic novel to adapt to a TV show or a film. So right now, this is a really great time to be in comics, especially if you create your own intellectual properties. Um, What's intellectual property? Intellectual property, is this anything that you, like something that you create um, that can be uh, adapted to any different to a different medium so so what you're basically saying if someone creates something yeah. out of their mind it actually has value it does have value right yeah i mean intellectual properties are all around us like someone who designed this stage this stage the design of this stage is an intellectual property somebody who designed the clothes and, and the shoes that we wear those are intellectual properties so art is an intellectual property in all its different forms so caleb caleb check it out you act you 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 produce um your sister is Jado. She's amazing. Yeah. Um, you guys collaborated in, in, as a family business in many ways. How do you approach the entertainment business? And it, was it Jada that brought you in or, or she inspired you or, or in, in the sense if you saw her and say, hey, I could help you? What was your mindset of entering the entertainment business? Well, for me, my love was storytelling. Um, I, I was, I'm an 80s kid, and I grew up watching all the 80s movies and things like that. So that was my, my passion was I always loved movies, and I was like, wow, I want to be able to, 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 to do that. And what, and what happened for me, the real change in my life for storytelling for me was my history class. 
Surprisingly, history teaches you everything you need to know about storytelling. It gives you characters, it gives you emotion, it gives you why they do what they do. And in this industry, storytelling is what it is, no matter what facet that you're in. Whether you're an actor, whether you're a writer, whether you're a director, whether you're a costume designer, whether you do hair and makeup, you're telling a story with your representation of it. And that, that to me was my biggest thing. Then also having a sister that when I was 11 was on a different world and it was like, oh, wow, that's Why really, really cool. Why did you make her so old, older than you? That's wrong. <laughs> it was like I had a sister when she was working professionally as an adult. I was very young. <laughs> you know, and but what Jada, what Jada did was she made it tangible because I'm like, wow, that's I know her. Like if she can do that, then it's absolutely an opportunity and a chance for me to do the same thing. I and that's, and that's absolutely skill. true. If any of these guys can do it, you can see that they're kind of uh uh. Any of you can be superstars. <laughs> it's true. Just look at them. Now, Gabriel is a superstar cinematographer. You've seen his movies that he's done. He is amazing. And could you talk about the idea of what does, what does that mean if someone says you're a, a director of photography or a cinematographer? What is that? Well, yes. Hi, hi everyone. Um, the first thing that you have to do, you have to really want it and want it to be a cinematographer, as I wanted to be in this panel. What, what, movies, <laughs> what movies have you worked on over the course of your career that we may have heard of? Well, you, I've, I've done films like SWAT, and now recently I have done a lot of work for Marvel Entertainment. I did a reshoot, a very strong additional photography for Guardians of the Galaxy, for Iron Man 1, 2, and 3, for Thor, Thor 2, Thor 3. Um, I'm, currently, I'm shooting MacGyver um, in Atlanta, a television series, the premiere on Friday, by the way. I know about that show, MacGyver. My show, Limitless, was on CBS last year. MacGyver took our place because they canceled us. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That ain't right. Uh, anyhow, so director of photography, what are we? We, we, are, we are the people in charge of cameras, lights, uh, grip equipment. We have... Uh, basically, we control, we are in charge of politics. We are in charge of controlling the actors, uh, the problems with the directors. We are, we are the commanders in chief there, the ones that, the, the field commanders, no commanders in chief, the field commanders, the ones that keep moving the set, uh, setting cameras, setting lights, uh, giving the look of the film. So everything that you see when you look to the screen, you're responsible for. Yes, sir. Which is amazing. Isn't that amazing? We don't think about that, that, that job. The other job I think we don't think about is, is Kevin has a job that, where he represents talent. He's at the most powerful agency in the world, the Creative Artist Agency. I tried to be with them, but they wouldn't sign me. Cause I, so I, my manager's named Lumpy. And he doesn't quite do as good a job as CAA. But, but, but Kevin, let's talk about what is it like to, 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 to represent talent and how did you get into that and how would someone even become a, a talent agent or a manager, et cetera? Sure. Um, let me take it back a step and just say, you know, my parents have no idea what I do for a living. Uh, I, I mean, it's, I think it's very obvious that I'm of Asian American descent. Uh, I grew up playing violin and piano and doing science fair, and that was entirely my worldview. Uh, some of you can relate. Um, I, I went to undergrad for biology and didn't really fall into the arts until my junior year of college, so for you guys, you're still on the early side. Um, I found that storytelling through theater was something that was just so vastly different from what I did on the scientific end of things that I figured as an extracurricular, you know, I'll skip a couple classes and, and go to the theater a little bit more and see what this turns into. Uh, I started at CIA as an intern uh, in 2012 and, and really just sort of fell in love with the company and the work that the people do there. My colleagues have been so supportive from day one of, of a person of color, especially young person of color coming into, the, into this industry isn't an easy thing. Um, my day-to-day -day is I work in our theater department. I represent writers, directors, actors, choreographers, uh, some composers here and there, specifically for the stage. Um, so uh, you guys might know of Leslie Odom Jr., who was Aaron Byrne Hamilton. He's a client of ours, and uh, folks like him, we, we sort of look out for their careers. At the end of the day, I look at agents as sort of matchmakers for the industry, you know, connecting actors and directors. Connecting. What's the most difficult part of your job? Most I challenging? Most interesting. I think the most interesting is the people. 
You know, I feel very fortunate. I, I'm not someone who ever wanted to be an actor or a writer or a director. I'm not, I'm frankly just not that talented, but I get to spend every day just talking to interesting people and making connections between them. Because at the end of the day, I'm not going to be the one who makes the movie, but I can help set up those connections of, of people that will get those things right. done. Hey, George, George, yeah. um, Baked FX, what is that? How did you create it? And, and, and what, how did you get in the entertainment business? And what, was you, what, what, what keeps you in it and what makes you love it? Uh, well, Baked Effects uh, is a visual effects company. We do uh, visual effects for movies, TV, uh, TV commercials. Uh, for me, visual effects has been almost a complete lifelong passion. Uh, middle school, high school, uh, just when love. you say effects company, what does that mean? Like, what 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 is what does that mean? Uh, well, I guess you could define uh, effects for movies, TV into two categories: physical effects, which are explosions, uh, anything that's kind of like physically created, uh, rain, um, any of the kind of natural elements that are facilitated on set, practically, physically there. Uh, visual effects, is, which is what I do, uh, the other category is all computer-based. Um, You're saying one, physical effects, one is what actually happens, and, and the, what you do is more or visual, so you can either have real rain on a set, or you can create the rain. Exactly right, yeah. And uh, as I was saying, lifelong passion, middle school, high school age, loved going to see movies, uh, loved the concept of films being an escape, uh, and what I wanted to do at that time was help facilitate you that You have escape. to know how to write code, because basically everything you do is on a computer, I, I would assume, right? Um, they're, they're varying degrees, um, certainly to kind of uh, elevate and push the bar a little bit. If you're into code, uh, you can do things that, I would say, off-the-shelf solutions can't do alone, if you know Adobe After Effects, uh, Maya, Nuke, I don't know if any Who here works with computers and works with effects and messes around with effects? That's a great, that's a great group. Okay. Yeah. So you've got these off-the-shelf solutions, which are great, but if you know how to code, you can push them beyond their limits uh, and create things that otherwise, you know, weren't possible inside the solution itself. Um, and for me, again, you know, lifelong passion, um, both visual effects and uh, kind of entrepreneurial aspirations always knew I wanted to start a company uh, about 10 years in a, uh, ago in LA. Uh, took the plunge after working for another visual effects company. Started Baked Effects and it's been, uh, it's been a roller coaster ride ever since. Amazing. So, 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 so Michael, Michael is the guy, and I wanted to save him towards the end. You know, uh, Michael is the guy that hires everybody you see up there, right? He is, the, he is the person who puts the entire project together and he makes a decision who's going to be the effects person, who's going to be the actor, who's going to be doing, doing what. Michael, could you talk about all the different groups of roles there are in creating a film and producing a film and how you go about uh, thinking about it and putting that whole thing together? Yeah, absolutely. And that's, you know, for me, growing up, I grew up in Toronto, and I, was, I just loved watching television and going to the movies, and, and I would, you know, see these incredible spectacles up on the screen and think, well, you know, what fun it would be to get to do something like that. Uh, and, and, you know, for me, what's always driven, um, you know, my, my ambition to work in this industry was it really looked like it would be a great deal of fun to do. So and what is your title, your official title my on official a, title a is, project? My executive producer. And what uh, does that mean? If you're an exec, because, you, you know, I see the credits roll all the time. It says executive producer. I don't even know what that means. What does that mean? Uh, it means I'm responsible for sort of putting together the production plan. So I'm given a script and I'm asked, you know, how do we turn this into a movie? How long will it take to shoot it? How long will it take to do the post-production? How much money will it cost? And I'm then tasked with, you know, breaking all of that down and determining, you know, where can we shoot this movie and, and, and how much money will it take to shoot this movie? And how do you determine those team? things? I mean, wh I, I, that's too big for me to even understand. How do you actually figure all that out? You really you break it down into, into very, very specific detail. You go page by page, scene by scene, you list every character that's in it, every reference to a prop, if somebody's holding a wallet or somebody's holding a phone, every location, if there is an effect, if there's rain, if there's snow, and then you know, that's where we talk to people like George. Do we want to do that as a practical effect where we create rain, or do we want to do it as a visual effect? So what are all the departments that go, that go into running down, and within the entertainment, when making a movie, List all the departments off the top of your head that you can think of. Oh, man, well, there's the you know, production department in the office. That kind what is of that? Is the, 
they, they're sort of the, the nucleus, the information center to make sure that everybody gets a, What are jobs in the production office? There's the production office coordinator. There's the assistant production office coordinator, production secretary. Okay, what's the, next, what's the next group? There's the assistant uh, directors. There's the first assistant director. What's an director. assistant director Oh, do? man, we got to slow this down just a little <laughs> no, bit. Oh, we don't got time. What do they do? What's an assistant director? The assistant directors are the right-hand uh, person to the director helping to organize the director's day to make sure all of the elements that the director needs. What's the next group? The next group, well, let's go into the lighting department. There's a cinematographer, and that's, that's Gabriel's uh, territory. So he'll have a gaffer who controls the lighting, the grips who controls all the equipment that comes onto the set, and then the three of them sort of run. What's a grip? What's a gaffer? I, know, I don't even know what that is. Nobody knows. <laughs> Nobody knows what they are. I see that in the credits. It says best boy, gaffer, grip. What are those names? We throw those in there really just to see who's paying attention. The, the, the gaffer runs the electrical department and they, anything that gets plugged in or turned on or lit up. That's Why don't they call the him the gaffer. electrician? That's too easy. We like to complicate things as much as possible to make sure that only people who really want to work in this industry uh, you know, continue through. They, they are all electricians. Okay, keep going. Keep going real quick. Real quick. What about just... makeup and hair? Are there jobs in that? They're great jobs for makeup and hair. So I could, could, I could be a them, makeup think, artist for, or I hair. I could have used one before the Okay, panel. what else? What else? What about costume design? There's costume design. There's production design. Anything you see. What's production design? Thank you for asking. The production designer <laughs> is responsible for setting the look of the entire movie. So, so they you know, set the look of the entire movie. That means the sets and all that? Exactly. Do they, the is there a job to paint the walls? No, we have painters to do that. Painters? Yeah. So I There's could be a, a any painter job on a movie? that you can think of. Really, anywhere you know in the world, there's a there's uh, an element of that that we will turn into a job on set. Absolutely. Okay, now let's go to what some people consider, at least in movie land, a very important job because if you're a star, you're a star. And sitting before us today is one of the brightest and shining stars on the big screen and Miss Regina Hall. I asked her out on a date one time, she said, no way. If you ain't Will Smith, mm-mm. <laughs> that was before Will was married. Before he was married. <laughs> Regina Hall, uh, talk to us about, first of all, what got you into the entertainment business, and why did you become an actor? And, and what is it about it that you love about it? And, 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 and what are the most difficult or challenging things about the job of being a superstar actress who makes a lot of money? <laughs> <laughs> oh, hell. Um, you know, one of the things that I do love about acting, to answer that question is, I enjoy it. I, I didn't go in, you don't go into it to be a star. You go into it for the work. And I really love the work. The byproduct is whatever it is. Look, I need to be next to him because he hires. <laughs> he lights, so this is how come I look good on camera. This is the man right here. And I think when you, you get to meet so many people, and I like being a different character outside of myself. I'm actually very shy. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when you get to perform, you get to uh, kind of come outside of yourself. and. Uh, be something else for a moment. It's kind of like a lens or a veil a little bit. So it's just been something I feel um, that I enjoy. But what's, what's great about it, and Jade is an amazing example, is when you do it, you do discover there's so many layers. And you want to go out and you want to produce and you get excited when you see new talent. And for me, I still get excited to work with people. I just worked with Jada for the first time. And, and what's so amazing about this job is the people you meet. And it's pretty incredible. And so I feel really fortunate. And that's in all departments and especially your co-stars. So it's an incredible job. Well, tell, tell me this, Regina. A lot of, you know, when I meet a lot of folks out there, um, you know, young, some people come up to me, man, Hill, um, can, you, can you give me the hookup, man? Get me on this, get me on this. And a lot of people don't realize that most actors who are, who are successful, um, they actually do a lot of training and they've worked at their craft. Could you talk about the journey? Because we don't hear about the journey. Oh, we we think that people just stepped off the curb and, and right into the limo. What was the journey for you becoming uh, a superstar? 
Well, I don't believe in hard work. I did the casting couch. No, that's a lie. <laughs> what does that, that mean? What's the cat? I don't even know what the casting couch is. Do you that think is the a lie. Is the casting couch available to me? I'm not sure what that is. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, in truth, it is a lot of work, and I did. You, you trained for years, and then there's the training that you get on the job. Okay, um, don't skip over that. I really want us to understand that. When you say you train for years, break down that training. Okay, what I, is that like? I, I studied. I went to school for what? three years, and um, then I did theater in New York after going to school. I mean, every Where did you go to school? I went to um, Sanford Meisner and studied the Meisner technique. What is years. the Meisner technique? <laughs> I feel like him. The Meisner technique, it's, it's, it's a technique, like there are many techniques. There's Stanislavski, there's, uh, um, what's her name, Uda, Uda, Uda Hagen. There's, there, um, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of techniques that people use for, to, to get into character, to emotionally. And I happen to use a Meisner, which has a lot to do with repetition. And then once you do the repetition, you... You, you do nursery rhymes and then you break down scenes. And it's, you know, it's a few years. They don't like you to audition, but it's, it is a technique where you can really learn your craft so that when you go to work or you go to audition, you actually know what you're doing. Because it is, it is a skill. It is a craft. A lot of people think that you just show up and you're like, oh. But there is work to do. There's a lot of preparation work before you actually go on camera. So, so do you remember your first audition? I remember, well, I didn't get the first 200. I probably so didn't. So talk about that. Um, you know, as, as actors, a lot of folks you see on the screen, you don't realize that most actors experience a great deal of rejection. In fact, most people in this business, no matter what you do, when you're coming up, you may get rejected. In fact, Sean, I'll ask Sean, did you, as you were creating artwork, did you submit it to people and people say, no, man, this isn't right? Or, or what, was that, what was that like? How do we deal with rejection? And just because we get rejected, does that mean we should quit? No. But um, I, I think, though, as an artist, what's more, what the most important thing is training, as we've talked about on the stage here, is that like, I started drawing from a very early age. I think when I was in elementary school, we had those old metal lunchboxes that kids can't bring to school anymore. Uh, but I used to have like a Star Wars lunchbox, and I had copied the drawing on it, and when I came and when I brought it home, my mom and my dad noticed that, and they said, oh, "Okay, this kid's got some kind of talent." So they enrolled, they enrolled me in a local community center art class. So I'm from the Bronx uh, originally, and so I basically took uh, painting classes one day a week at this local community center, and it helped me build up my portfolio. And then I went to uh, Fiorello LaGuardia High School of Music and Art, majored in art for four years, and I got my degree in illustration from the School of Visual Arts. And then, and then I got my first work from Marvel Comics when I was a junior in college. So I say all that to say that any, with, with any art form that you choose to go into, you have to study. You have to practice. Because there's just so much competition out there, which is great, but it makes you better. And I think that that is the most important thing. So when you go out, and there have been times where, like, you know, I fortunately have been working pretty steadily since I got my first job when I was a junior in college. That's when I got my first work from Marvel Comics. And at that time, there was only one major comic convention in the country, and that was the New York Comic Con. And at the time, Marvel and DC would send their editors there, and that's when they would look for work. They would look for new artists to hire, and you would go there with your portfolio, you would wait online, show an editor your work, he would flip through your page, through your pages, and if he liked your stuff, he'd give you his card and say, give me a call. Other times, he'd say, eh, you gotta fix this, you gotta fix that, your anatomy's bad. So good point. Anybody, if you're an artist out there, take out your little, your, your, your booklet, Turn the page, draw something right now <laughs> while you're sitting there, and before Sean leaves, tackle him and show him what you just drew and say, yo, do I got the stuff? Am I good? And he'll, he'll give you a response because getting this guy together, oh, Sh Sean, what do you think about this, the stick figure? He just did it. We'll talk later. Okay, we'll, we'll talk, talk later. later. We'll talk later. Oh wait, okay. that was on Overbook so, Stationery. Okay, we, you, you, you got a, you got a future. You're going places. You're going places. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about this concept of relationships and networking within this industry. How important is that? And how should one approach that? How do you how do you meet 
people that might be mentors, that might help you. This is open to every, anybody. How should someone approach that if they're interested in something or they think they're interested in it? How would they go about accessing uh, uh, somebody that could be a mentor or a role model? Networking is vital to this industry. It's how things are done. It's people that you know, ways that you get into it. It's like the, the introduction and being places where people that you want to be like or work in their field are at. But the most important thing, in order to grab a mentor, you have to have a deep love for something because a, a mentor guides you and they're giving you something of themselves. So in return, you have to have the passion. Meaning if they say, okay, meet me here at 6 a.m. and do this, you, you, you need to do that because you're showing them that you care about what they have to teach you. It's like anything, if you're, it's, it's, it's so important to, to understand that aspect of it. It's not, nothing in this industry is going to be easy. It's a lot of work, but the love will keep you going. The love for it will keep you um, um, paying attention and learning and always striving, but the, the networking of it is, it's vital. It's, 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 again, it's how things are done. Relationships with people, meeting someone, following up, staying in contact. Those are the ways that you'll be able to start getting your foot in. And then once you get your foot in, it's up to you as an individual, the person that you are, how hard you're going to go get it. Because once the door is open, it's up to you now. You know what I mean? Like, you got to go get it. Nobody is going to continue to hold your hand through it. You're going to get the lessons that you get, and a mentor is there for a certain amount of time, teach you what you need, and then you need a, another one as you advance and your skill level goes up. So. Gabrielle, if, if, if someone's sitting out there and they say, you know what, I want to be the person that, that creates the, what's on the screen, now, oftentimes, you don't just jump to, 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 to being the cinematographer. How would I approach becoming you? What, what, what is my, what's my journey? Who do I need to meet? What kind of job do I need to do? And how, what is that progression? Well, definitely your best mentor is yourselves. Practice, practice, practice. That's Does that mean important. I could pick up an iPhone and shoot my own movie? <laughs> you can do that. You what if I have a Samsung? <laughs> you can do the Samsung too. Okay, okay, that's good. Yeah, yeah, and don't take a picture. I will not be judging every picture. No, but what is important is that, is, is doing it. Telling every day practicing, going to museums, learn about composition, whether you will follow school or not. What does composition mean? Composition is the way that you place the elements within the frame. I don't understand that. So you're saying I can choose a frame to show things and leave th certain things out? Well, remember one thing, that what we do, everything that is outside the camera doesn't exist. It's like a tree falling in the woods. There you are. Anything that is, <laughs> yes, anything that is not there on the frame, in the frame, within the frame doesn't exist. So it's very, very important for us to know what, how we're going to compose that, how we're going to place those elements. And for that, we need to educate our eye. We need to see films, as many films as we can. We need to expose ourselves. So as we're watching a film, if we want to do what you do, what should we be looking for as we watch a TV show or a film? What are the things in the frame we should be seeing? Everything. The elements in which the, 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 the people are composed of their place within the frame. The movement. The movement is very important. The movement I, of the people or the movement of the camera? The movement of people, the movement of the camera, the movement of the elements. You see films like Kurosawa, for instance. Every frame, every element in the frame, everything moves in the background. Analyzing those films, being very serious about the way that you educate your eye and see those films, those television shows, because everyone there doing it are real professionals. We've been through a very strong training process in every part, of, in every area that we do. We work very, very, very hard to be there. And they are, every time that we put a camera, we set a light, we do a piece of acting, we are do a drawing, a design, we decide who's going to act. Can I ask a act. specific question? I notice when I'm on, 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 you know, doing a scene with like a really pretty girl like Regina, they, they light, they light the pretty girl, the light hits the back of her head. And I'm like, how come you light the back of the actress's head um, when I'm doing the scene. Why do you do that? I never get the light on the back of my head. 
How, why do you do that? Just give an example. Well, That's no, an example of you making a choice, right? Is, uh, totally, so why yes. backlight someone? Well, you see, it, this is a very interesting, a fascinating example because backlighting is, is something that separates the character from the background. And indeed, it's been used in tremendous amount of schools of photography, cinematography. But nowadays, nowadays, some cinematographers, the younger generation said, we don't want to put backlight. We don't want to use backlight. Even if it's a window behind, even if it's something behind that justifies the backlight, I do not want to do that because it's a it, creative choice. I want you to choice. light me up like it's heaven. Like, I don't, I don't want one line showing. I want to be iridescent. Like, I want to, I want to are, glow almost. You like, do glow. George, George, let's talk. George, here. come over here, here, actually, because someone over there said they couldn't see you behind the podium. You know, I got feedback. Come over here, right here. So, George, will you, let's talk about the effects side of the ball, because I think a lot of folks out here love post-production. They love the effects. When we talk about post-effects or post-production, um, what are the things we need to be thinking about? And, and then also, do you get involved at the very beginning of a script process and then once the, the, the footage is delivered to you, that's when you start messing with it? Are you working with it throughout the process of the project? How do you work with a, a, a film or, or TV show? Yeah, I would say in a, in a perfect world, uh, visual effects is involved from the very beginning uh, during the prep and pre-production process. Uh, going through the script, working with all the department heads, that means a cinematographer, that means a production designer, that means all the, basically the, the key personnel in the film to help design the visual effects, uh, leveraging the talents and the abilities of all these different departments to make the effects as good as they can be, as affordable as they can be, as easy to shoot as they can be. Um, and then that's the pre-production process on set, visual effects supervisor, uh, is normally on set to make sure that... When you say visual effects supervisor, you're saying that someone from your company is literally on set while they're shooting? Exactly. Why? Uh, so when you're reading the script, you're breaking down the visual effects that are going to be in your film, for example. Uh, you're basically committing to a certain type of effect uh, that'll take a certain amount of time and cost a specific amount of money. So to be on set... You're there to advocate for the visual effects in the film. You're there to make sure that you're photographing it, you're shooting it the way it should be uh, for, again, the best possible visual effects shot. And you're also well, there... Well, why, why does the way you shoot something impact visual effects? I don't understand that. Why is it important the way you shoot it? Why, why can't you just, with your computer afterwards, no matter how you shoot it, mess with it and, and you can do what you do? Why is, why is what happens on the day important? Uh, so here's an example. Right now we're shooting a film that we need to add a uh, CGI tornado to. So rather than just create the tornado completely from scratch, I'm on set making sure that practical effects gives me real wind so that the actors are there and they're getting wind across their clothes. That's a much harder thing to do in visual effects. I'm there to make sure that uh, camera and lighting is giving me lightning flashes, which would be a hard thing to do in visual effects. So there to make sure we're getting all these great interactive elements to make the shot as believable, as effective as possible. Is it sometimes in your job, do you bump up against other departments? Because you just mentioned wind, and I know when I'm acting, the sound department hates wind because it makes sound in my mic, right? But you need wind because you need the clothes to move. Who rules the roost when you say, yo, I need wind, but sound says no wind because that's noisy. And then you start fighting, and then Michael steps in as the producer and says, yo, visual effects, yo, sound, Stop fighting because I run the show and I'm going to... Michael, how do you handle that? That was exactly the way I handle it. <laughs> okay, I, I put them both in their corners. So what do you do? How do you make a decision over one department over another? Well, I, it's, you know, it's really, it is a collaboration and you have to figure out how do you get all of the elements that we need and what's the, we, what's the most important thing to get on the day. Uh, sound, you know, obviously very important when people go to see the movie. As a friend of mine who's a sound mixer says, you don't pay for the headphones to watch the movie on an airplane. You know, you pay to listen. So every single thing that you do on a movie set is important, and it all, you know, there are repercussions to every decision that you make. If you need the visual effects element and you need to have the wind, then, you know, you do need to get it. Uh, and then you have to find a way to make the sound work, whether you get a take without the wind so you have it clean, or you figure out how to go back in post-production and do something called ADR where you, you know, you, you, you replace the dialogue later. Uh, either way, you're going to get everything that you need to get, and hopefully nobody gets into a screaming match on the set. Okay, who out here has a question for our panel? Anybody got a question? 
Okay. Um, Ms. Jada Pinkett Smith has a question for our panel. Um, could you please stand up and ask your question, please? So I, I'm very interested, Kevin, in knowing how you got from an internship to becoming an agent at CAA. Could you explain that process? I think it actually... That was the best question of the day. <laughs> good question. I, I think at the end of the day, it's quite simple, and a few of the panelists here have touched on it. It doesn't matter what side of the industry you're in. At the end of the day, you just have to outwork everyone else. You know, you put your head down, you do the work. Um, isn't, that, isn't that a line from Hamilton? <laughs> it's out, outwork, outlast from, from it, Hamilton? It is. It's a line from, from your Hamilton. client, That's Leslie Odom Jr., That's it. the ri fastest rising star <laughs> in Hollywood today. For real, for real. You know, His client. I, I think, you know, as, uh, as a woman, as a person of color, uh, as a member of the LGBT community, there are things that are going to work against you, but if you're willing to outwork all of your peers, regardless of uh, who your parents are, regardless of how much money you have, uh, you can really make a difference in this industry. Because I think at the end of the day, it's about, all, we're all storytellers. That's what our goal is here. And a diversity in perspectives when it comes to storytelling is going to be the most important thing, I think. Now, Kevin, forward. what many people may not know is that you went to my alma mater, um, Harvard University, and, um, and, you know, we're not, we, we were there almost at the same time, you know, because, you know, black don't crack, you know. <laughs> you know. Uh, could you talk about the importance of education and, and just in terms of career and, and, and what you do? And, and, and it, oftentimes in entertainment business, people say, well, I don't need to go to school because you don't need a degree to do this. You certainly don't even need a high school diploma to do what I do as an actor. You don't need it. But how does education play into what you do? Uh, for me, I studied evolutionary biology at Harvard. That's what my degree is in. Uh, it doesn't play into my work at all here. Um, I think my time at Harvard, though, I started working in a theater on campus there as an extracurricular activity my junior year. And I think those four years for me as a time to explore something completely different from what I wanted to do with no consequence, essentially. You know, if you do a summer internship and it doesn't go anywhere, that's fine. You go back to school, you, you still finish your degree. I think that time to explore and that time to play was more valuable than anything. You know, okay, who out here has a question? Who, 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 who? I see. I see right here. Hello, what's your name? Hi, I'm Charlotte. Charlotte, what's your question? I have a question for anyone um, or even... No, you got to pick somebody. Hey, Kevin, since you were talking about internships, I'm in school and I volunteer with everything. Like I'm on radio, TV, I have my hands in post-production after everything, but I'm applying for internships. How do you stand out on an internship when you have experience? Great question. How do you get the job? How do you get an internship? I think it, it, there's two parts to it. I think it's your resume first, right? The thing that gets you in the door, the thing that gets people interested. Um, I mean, when I'm looking at internship applications for our incoming interns at CIA, the things that stand out to me that essentially knock people out of the running are, you know, typos, sloppy formatting, all these things happen, right? If you're going to outwork everyone, you, you need to be as perfect as you can in the work that, in, in the chance that you have to present yourself. I think the same goes for college essays. You know, if you only have 500 words to really talk to an admissions officer, you better make those 500 words count. So I think your resume is the first one. And then once you're in the room, once you get an interview, it's on you to really stand out. Um, hey, uh, and somebody, anybody else, let's talk about internships that's not, you know, CAA is a major corporation and, 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 and more formal. What about more informal roles? How could someone, you know, become a sh shadow you on a set? How could they shadow you on a production? What could they do to learn art or, or become a role model? Caleb, how could they come to the office of Overbrook and, and learn about what you do and, and those types of things? What, what, what's the process for that? How, how should they approach that? Well, the first thing, if you... For speaking for Overbrook, it's, it's your love of story. Oh, explain and what Overbrook is real quick. Overbrook is, is a production company that, that I work for and um, produce mo film and television for. And for us, it's always going to be your passion for story over everything. The, how you love it and then your, your, your approach to it. And you'll be surprised. Passion for that what we do will outshine others. There'll be people in there that are like, eh, you know, it's cool, I like it, you know. And then there's others that are like, Caleb, 
I love what you do. Can you send me the script that you read today? Can I look at that? And then they'll send me notes. They'll email me and send me notes. And I respond to anybody. I have an open door policy at, with any intern in my office. If you love it and you want to do something, you can come to me and pitch me an idea. You can walk in and say, listen, that is whack what you guys are doing. You should be doing this. Can I, can I, can I pitch you an idea? Absolutely. I like, like, you're always working. Storytelling is always developing. What Kevin was talking about, education. You don't, it's not just a, a college thing. You're in education every single day of your life. You are learning and developing as a person. And for what we do with storytelling, the more interaction you have with other people, the better you're going to be at telling stories. The more life that you live, the more experiences that you have, the better your stories are going to be. Everything is about evolution and growing. So in our industry, it's the most important thing. At least at Overbrook, that's what I look for. I want to find people that love this and have a passion for it and show me how much they love it. And that's how you rise through the ranks at my company. Who else got a question on this side? Yes, 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 yes. Hold on, hold on, but he raised his hand first. I'm kidding, go ahead. Okay, oh my God. Okay, I cut you off. If you ain't, if you ain't ready, it ain't an oh my God moment. It's an ask a question moment. Um, I just wanted to know, Regina, you've come a long way from all of your movies and you've been very successful and I just want to know, what would you contribute your success to? Who is that for? Um, That's for Regina, right? Regina, what would you attribute your success to? Why, why, why you, when he knows there's 10,000 other actresses out there that are trying to be you, why are you top four in the game? <laughs> Well, you know, I have, um, um, I, one, I did study, and, and I agree with what they said. What you bring to, is, to, your, to your craft come, has a lot to do with your experience. So I really want to stress the importance of education first. I, I, I went to NYU not for acting, but for journalism, which is another version of storytelling, and I got my master's there. And I went to Fordham here, undergrad. So... For me, like literally understanding story is important, but um, another thing that's been great for me is I have a really passionate team. An agent um, and, and a manager who support you is vital to your career because they- Where, where are you represented? I am represented at uh, ICM um, is my agent and Principato Young. And I've had agents and managers because I am like Jada, older than him. And, um, and there, there, you know, there's, 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 there's ageism. And so uh, there's someone that has to believe and push you. That have you, you had to leave representation over the course of your career or have you had the same representatives? Um, actually, ironically enough, um, I had an agent. I mean, yeah, but, you know. We ain't gonna go into that now, Hill. <laughs> well, I just wanted to give an I've example that sometimes you have time. to pivot and shift to continue yes. to grow. Yes, that's my I, point. Yes, yes, you do. But what I will say is, I have been with my agent who started off as an assistant, and people said I would not work with that agent. Your agent is the same as you. Their passion, my agent has grown and become a bigger agent than when I started with him. So you can move, but you don't have to jump if your agent or your team is passionate because their passion takes them to the next level and then, and your passion and you together. But, but what I wanna say too is, you know, um, although I love what I do, when you go to work, it's a team effort. So I think a lot of it has to do with attitude. When you go on set, you are working with a cast and a crew that are there, a crew that's there hours before you go. And I, and I think one of the most important things anybody can do is be, be, um, be smart and great at what you do, but also be able to get along with people. It's, you know, you spend a lot of hours a day. You want to respect your director and everyone around you so that you realize that it's a collaboration. And although people may see you, you're not the most important part. Every part is equally important in a production. So you want to bring professionalism and patience to your, to your sets. Yes, yes. Here we go. Jada clap, because Jada knows. <laughs> How did what you wanted to be as a child um, change over time? Like, compared to your job that you have now, how, did, how is that different from what you grew up wanting to be? Okay, so how many of you, when you were young, 
thought or knew that you wanted to be in the entertainment business, and how has that evolved, or, or how has your perspective evolved over time? You know, I think I, I've, as an artist, I've, I've wanted to be an artist ever since I was a little kid in elementary, so I've been really fortunate to be doing exactly what I want to do. So, um, but I just think that, as we've talked about it, art is a form of storytelling, and so for me, I've definitely seen myself progressing beyond just sort of drawing comic books and telling a story in a two-dimensional format versus going into directing. That just seems like a very natural progression for me in terms of like what I want to do. Okay, who wants to ask last? We got two questions left. I, they have to be the best two questions. Are you sure that you, are you sure? <laughs> You're positive. Okay, hold on. Whisper your question to me, I'll let you know. Okay, that's a good question, but not good enough. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, it's good. In fact, I'll ask that, I'll ask that. What's your question? Okay, that's a really good question, but not good enough. I'm sorry, I, 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 gotta, I gotta do better, here we go. Okay, 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 this is interesting. That's really interesting question. I thought it was a fantastic question. Oh, man. Yes? Okay. Okay. So all of those questions were phenomenal. And I'm going to say them all. And they're open to the panel. So, one, what's the greatest book you've ever read? And what, and what book should be shared? Another is how do you deal with working or succeeding or, or shining in a saturated market like the entertainment business. Number two, uh, as a, this, this is going to be obvious who this question is for, as a woman of color in the entertainment business, how do you deal with that? And number three, how do you deal with negativity uh, when, when haters come at you uh, as a public figure in the entertainment business? Those four questions are, are on the table. And those are four questions that I want you guys to take on. Go. Regina, go ahead. Yeah, the Regina, book. go. <laughs> the book, 100 Years of Solitude. 100 Years of Solitude by? Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Gabriel Garcia Marquez. 100 Years of Solitude. That's a good one. I love books. As a matter of fact, I really love books. Sorry, that just came out. Um, <clears throat> what was the woman of color question that I assume was for me? How, how do you deal with being a woman of color in the entertainment business? What are the, how do you overcome the challenges that that may present? You know, I, um, it, is who, it is who you are, it is who we are, and it is amazing. <clears throat> there are stories being told that sometimes people think may need to be one race, and you have a team that is passionate, and sometimes people change it. I think that you have to make sure that you don't see who you are as an obstacle. Embrace everything about yourself. Like, I am a woman of color, and what I don't get is not for me, and what I do get, I am proud of. Um, and I, I really feel like we have an opportunity, as in, in, in this time frame right now, as women of color, there are a lot more opportunities, and I think those will continue to grow. So, you know, allow, don't allow that to be a part of how you conceive yourself. Okay, how do we succeed? In a saturated market, in, in a place that it's crowded, uh, we've kind of touched on this already, but, 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 but uh, how do we succeed in a, in a marketplace that is, it, you know, there's a lot of people trying to do what we want? I think one thing that's universally true is that people want to be entertained. You know, so there's, there's never going to be a limit on the number of entertainers and performers. And one thing that the panel's, you know, said over and over again is passion. And if you guys are passionate about what you do, then just keep doing it. Actors in this room, find the other actors, put on plays. Directors in this room, find the actors and help them. Writers, give them some new material. You know, look around the room because you guys are the future of the entertainment industry. You're the next generation of the people who are gonna take us you know, to that next level. And I want you to think even bigger than that. You're the future leaders of this industry. And you guys are gonna get to shape what comes next. So just keep going, just keep doing it. And then the work will come to you, and people will notice, and that's how your careers will expand and help each other. And, and, and finally, the question about negativity, and we can also roll into that uh, a rejection, disappointment. 
And in fact, that's why I said I, I was giving you guys an example. You guys gave me all great questions, but my response was not good enough. Oftentimes in the entertainment industry, you may be the most talented person. You may have the best idea, but for whatever reason, someone's going to say, nope, nope, nope. And you're going to have to keep showing up even though you know your question was good enough, right? And, and it was good enough, and that's why I asked it. But the point is, is oftentimes you'll hear the negative or you'll get the rejection. And the question you have to ask yourself is, am I willing to stick in it, stay in it? And how, what's the best way to deal with negativity or, 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 or rejection? How, how can we keep moving forward even though that we experience that? Well, I think it really depends on the type of negativity. I mean, if it's someone who is not... Like for me as an artist, like I, I know that someone is not going to like my particular work or it might not, they might not respond to it. If they give me constructive criticism, I can take that and build and do better. And that's the most important thing because if anything that you want, anything that's worth having is worth fighting for, it's worth working for. So if someone tells you no, sure, you can you know, get, get pissed off, you might be a little hurt, give yourself five minutes to work it through, but then keep going. You know, but I, de but I definitely think that if it's someone who's, who knows what they're talking about, if you're trying to get into a particular field and someone gives you criticism that is serious, you have to take it seriously, apply what they've said, and make yourself better. And then just keep going. Just, it's, it's, it's really how badly you want it. And it's not enough just to want it. You got to work for it and you have to be competitive with what you're putting out. Because everyone sitting right next to you, they're your competition. The world is your competition. So you've got to be better than the next woman or man. Next Regina, will you give us a final word? Yeah, I just, I want to say there is a lot of rejection. There's also a lot of support. But what I think for me, and I will just share with you, with you what I believe, um, the business is amazing, but period. And I also believe that it is so important for all of us outside of what our vocation to have a spiritual center that is, that will be what will keep you able to survive the negativity because there is something bigger than your no, there is something bigger than your fear, there is something bigger than every system outside of yourself. And that connection to that power is really the thing that carries you and sustains you because even when you make it, even when there is success, there are still no's. There is still rejection. I know he ain't hired me. I, I know it. And I know I asked. But it's okay because he will. And, and you know that it's not personal. So I just would advise you all are amazing and you're beautiful and you're vibrant. And, and the frequency that flows in you is, is, is God. And when you hold on to that, I really believe you can sustain the waves and the highs and the lows of life, and especially the business. Thank you for that. Everybody stand on your feet. Give it up for this amazing panel. Thank you, you guys. Thank you. You guys are incredible. You are incredible. Thank you.